you read the story, actually, it talks about how I turned my life around and how I've helped other people. But the headline just read, you know, jail drug addict or dra- dra- jail drug dealer become trying to become an MP. And, you and know, I, when I was younger, I blamed my mother and father, but I had to learn to forgive them to move on. Because if you hold bitterness in your heart against somebody, the only person it damages is yourself. You've very, got very you've, powerful you've, lies, you've, yeah. These were people who were putting a needle in their arm every single day for a fix of heroin, otherwise they couldn't survive. We're taking them off the streets, transforming their lives, changing them, you know, through the program what we had, and it was a rigid program. Yes, it was strict. But it had to be because these people are indisciplined like myself. When I was younger, you need that around you. And then watching them grow, go back to college, university, to get jobs, to get married, some of them, set up their own businesses. It was a success story. Experience Real Podcast. Hey, Rich, thanks yeah. for coming in, mate. Appreciate you coming. Yes, uh, yeah, it's just good to be here. Thanks for the invite. That's, that's most important. I don't get out much, you know what I mean? So it's nice to be invited. That's all right, mate. No <laughs> problem at all. I've seen, you know, obviously come across your stuff on Facebook a while back. Uh, I think more so leaning towards when the gyms were closed. Uh, seen you obviously trying to impact that in a major way, and I thought I better have this guy on. We couldn't <laughs> make it work at the time due to uh, certain restrictions and things, but we're here now. So, yeah, well, these restrictions have killed us all. Now, to be honest, I mean, it's been a, it's been difficult for gyms, hospitality, pubs, leisure centres. I mean, the impact of this in this pandemic has had on people's lives is absolutely massive. And I think I got involved in it because, of course, a number of gym owners got in touch with me and said, Rich, because of my political campaign, you know, I'm into politics, as you know, and I thought to myself, is there something I can do? And I got involved with Welsh Health Matters. I was on the march down in Cardiff, thousands of us marching to the Senate down in Cardiff, you know, making our voice heard, saying, look, gyms should be classed as essential for a whole range of reasons. People's mental health, people's well-being, their immune system are made stronger when in the yeah. gym. You know, the transmission rate in gyms was so low, it was unbelievable. You're more likely to catch the, the, the virus at the time in a supermarket than you were in a gym. And to me, politicians make crazy decisions sometimes. The people like you and me and people on the street, we just don't get it. And I started to get it and thought, someone needs to challenge the establishment. And that's what I did. And that's why I got involved in politics, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, mate. Well, I, I totally agree. Like, there's not been enough emphasis on the fact that we're not building our immune systems you know, you're kind of forced to live in, in your four walls where you're too close to the fridge, you're too close to the sofa, <laughs> and you can't do much about it. I know you can get out of the yeah. house for your hour a day and whatever, but it's not very motivating for most people to have to go out on their own. That's why personal trainers, gyms, that's why yeah. they all exist. If we could all go and do a 1,000 push-ups and run 10 miles yeah. well, in uh, our yeah, location, it is, it is. we would, I, wouldn't I, we? Yeah, and I think you, you've had like lots of professional athletes on your show here, right? And they, they're disciplined because they're working towards a goal, you know, from Sean George to Kadena to all these different ones, and you've had Selby's coaching you just recently. These are people whose whole life and world is built around that discipline of the gym. But there are people out there that are casual gym users that rely on it for their mental health because they struggle with depression. So these aren't disciplined people, and that small part of their life, when it's taken away from them, has a huge impact on their emotional well-being. And and I saw that. I had people call me up and say, Rich, I'm going... driving me nuts like you know i'm suicidal and i was like i i I haven't got the answers but at least i was there at the end of the end of the phone to say listen you're going to get through this we can get we can do this together and i think that's where a lot of people let themselves down they don't talk which brings me to my own stories you know because my my troubled teenager growing up in clearly you know i weren't a i weren't a very nice boy when i was younger i you know i got involved in all sorts of uh, kind of stuff you know what i mean yeah so let's let's take it back to there then so obviously grew up in clearly uh i read an article on you actually uh, a while back on Wales Online, I yeah. think it was. Um, which, so, which one? Because there's been a few articles. They're not all in my favour, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this one was in your favour or not. I don't know. Well, but uh, obviously it talked a little bit about you getting into trouble. I think it was... Um, was it dr- jail drug de- dealer trying to become MP or something? That was the like one that was, that was the ah, one yeah, I yeah. seen, mate. Well, Hard-hitting headline. <laughs> yeah, that was by my mate Martin Shipton. I know him from Wales Online. He's a journalist. And uh, when he did when he did the story, I said, Mark, be gentle now. Because if you read the story, actually, it talks about how I turned my life around and how I've helped other people. But the headline just read, you know, jail drug addict or dra- dra- jail drug dealer become trying to become an MP. I'm like, that's not very good. It catches the headline, obviously, but it doesn't do me any favours. And I yeah. got slaughtered for it, mate. I mean, I was trolled. People online, on Twitter, on Facebook, just totally keyboard warriors. Never say to my face in a pub. Yeah. But they got the balls behind the keyboard. And, I, you know, I, I just had all that. But it was my upbringing. You know, I was 13 years of age, started smoking cannabis. I got a tattoo of it on my arm. You And... Growing up with three younger brothers, my my one of my brothers died at thirty five from taking heroin. He had really, a heroin yeah. overdose, which really devastated my family, myself. You know, I was in that kind of lifestyle, really. You know, struggling to grow up. Parents divorced when I was ten years of age. I was put into foster care, split away from my family. 
went to Swansea Prison Young Offenders Institute when I was 16. Uh, and then my whole life was around like, that kind of culture. I didn't know anything else, you know, so I never had opportunity. Kicked at a school of 15 for taking magic mushrooms, tripping my face off, you know, and <laughs> seeing all kinds of things. Yeah. So my whole childhood, and, you know, when I was younger, I blamed my mother and father, but I had to learn to forgive them to move on because if you hold bitterness in your heart against somebody, the only person it damages is yourself. You've very, got very you've, powerful you've, lies, you, yeah. yeah you, you know, I've, I've seen it with people. I've, I've talked and counseled people and they've said, Rich, but I can't, I can't, I, I get that. I get the emotion and the pain of it. But if you don't, the only person it, it really harms is yourself. Yeah. You know, as hard as it is. You don't forgive what they've done, but you forgive them for the pain that they caused. Are you with me? Yeah, well, you, otherwise you're going to go through your whole life in this reoccurring cycle which is only going to end up, like you said, reflecting on yourself. Isn't yeah, it? And, and you become like I was. You become an angry teenager. I was just... I was angry. I was angry at everything. Hated police, hated authority, hated anything, told me what to do. Started smoking cannabis, then taking speed, fat, and all the other drugs that come with it. And then the whole, my whole lifestyle then, you know, the heroin and all that kind of stuff with my brothers as well. It, it just, life was just a one big mess. And I, there's no other way of explaining it. And, and you feel trapped. And there's, there's people watching the program today, probably as well, Joe, that, you know, they don't know the answer. They're trapped in something. It's a cycle, a vicious cycle they can't get out of. You know, and it, it, it takes over your whole life. And, you, you know, you need you, you need something to break that cycle. Yeah. And and, that, and that's really what I was looking for, but I couldn't find it. And we'll come to that, no doubt, in yeah. a few moments. Mate, I, I totally, you know, sympathise with you. You cut all these factors, they play in, like, it's easy for someone to look at that headline on that article and say, he's a bad bloke. Have yeah. you read the rest of it? Seen maybe the things that's happened in your life that's different to theirs that led you to this position? Um, and also then to get to where you are now, you know, you've got to look at it like people can change. Yeah. People can alter their life. You can't judge them on one moment because we've all done things we regret. We've all done things that are fucked up in yeah, our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? In, uh, it, listen, listen, I always say to people, whatever people say about me, it's never as bad as the truth. <laughs> yeah, let's be honest, like, because there's stuff about you and I and our viewers watching, you know, we've done worse than what people know about. And we don't, we don't broadcast it, but that's the reality. Because we're human beings, we all fail. There is no such thing as a perfect human being. And what gets my goat even more than anything else is somebody who thinks they're better than somebody else. And that really riles me. And I've seen it, especially on social media, because it's, it's toxic with it, you know, because they hide in anonymity where you don't know who they are, right? Yeah. So you haven't got a clue who they are. They sat down, probably still living with their mother, knitting or something like that, you know what I mean? They're just, you know, and, they're, and they're, they're passing comment and judgment on somebody else's, maybe their body shape, maybe bullying them, you know, online bullying as well. I've seen it with my own children. You know, and that kind of toxic stuff goes on on social media, and it's unchecked. I, I in fact, I've been a big advocate for, and some viewers might not agree with this, of social media. Actually, you having to produce some form of identification. So when you join Twitter, Facebook, you can't be anonymous. You have to know who the person is. Yeah. So if they're making certain remarks, they should be held to account. Because I, I think it's wrong. People can hide behind that anonymity. I think it's just yeah. wrong. Well, I, I agree with the remarks. Um, I suppose people like a counter argument to that yeah. would people. You know, well, they can uh, say what they want. It's free, look, I, I, free I agree. Like you should. Yeah, be, if you want to call me a twat, if you want to call me whatever, you want. Yeah, that's fine. Just own up to it. Like. I, I'm I'm cool with that. But like you know, I'd like to know who you are first of all, because I can write the reply. But also, you know, I have got no problem in people, you know, having to go to someone and say don't like them. Yeah. You know, I got thick skin. Listen, I you I wouldn't be in politics if I didn't. You know, I, the stuff I've had said to me, you know, through social media, it would make you know your toes curl. But it doesn't bother me. I just laugh at it. In fact, sometimes I joke back with them. You know, I say it must be lonely being you or something like that. I have a bit of fun with them. It's because social media, let's be honest, it's not the real world, is totally. it? It's the kind of world we want others to think is is what we're doing. So when you see Instagram or you know, Twitter, Facebook, all these things, a lot of what people put out there is an impression, but it's not the actual. And yeah. I think that's what we're trying to do. It's it's got double life. So this is the world I, I want you to think I live in, but this is the world I really live in. And I think the world we really live in. Social media, there should be boundaries because it's those who are closest to us, our real friends and family, the ones where we open up to. Social media is not the place to open up to people. I, I keep saying to people on Facebook, don't chuck all your dirty laundry on Facebook because, fr quite frankly, people don't care, right? They, they don't. And 
I, fi- I find it sometimes like a cesspool of emotion. And I, I know why, because they're reaching out. They're trying to find some help. You're not going to find it on social media. Yeah. And I've always said to people, don't go chucking all that crap on Facebook. Like It's not good for you. It doesn't look good for you and your family. Just keep away from it. Do you know what I mean? It causes more problems in the long yeah, run, yeah, doesn't it? it does. it's, it's a dangerous place, 100%. And, you know... It's taken over as well. These last five, ten years, it's just gone absolutely mental. Like, I know, even looking at my screen time, it's hours of the day. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Close to ten hours a day some days. Yeah. And it's like, how the hell have I spent that much time yeah. on my phone? And everyone, most people are in the same boat yeah. as you are. I'm sure, like, running, like, a, your, your rich politics and yeah. everything, you can't help but get involved in this. Well, it it's, is. It's, it's kind of addictive, Nick, because it's, it's the new form of media. So we got the mainstream media, right, who tell us what they... You know what they want us to believe, right? So you know your BBCs, your Sky News, your ITV, and all that. So there's they, they, there's a, an, an agenda with them, right? In my opinion. Yeah. But then social media allows ordinary people to have an input into that kind of conversation. So we we don't have to believe everything you read on, you know, Google or your mainstream media. But actually, there's other people with other opinions. And I think what social media has done with the good and the bad, because there's both mentioned the toxic side it's allowed people to express an opinion without it being censored for now uh, if <laughs> well trump tried it it didn't work for him no. the he, <laughs> yeah, he's, got out. And he's gone <laughs> well he's coming back i think I, i've heard some rumors i know nigel farage is out in america on a tour at the minute someone who i know who came to Ebervale with me on my ca- campaign during the general election i know he's he's, he's planning a comeback so that's Do you mind if I just yeah yeah that's that so that's definitely happened he's on he's, he's on a comeback um but yeah so i mean going back to my story so Turn my life around. I went to a Christian rehab. Um, I'm not the best Christian now, if I can say that, but I still believe I believe there's a God. It, yeah. You know that like the spiritual side of things helped me to turn my life around. You know, I, I don't expect everyone to believe what I believe. I, I don't go around Bible bashing people. My friends will know this. It's not me. But what I would say is that it gives me something to believe in that gives me strength to change. Yeah. And um, and that really helped me, and it it helped me turn my life around. I I think that's kind of you know. Whatever you believe in, like you say, there's people who are uh, Muslims, Christians. Yeah. I think a lot of it is just having that faith in something, yeah. that there's a higher power. This is the reason we uh, be good to people. They all have, you know, the same sort of underlying principles with a lot of it. Yeah. And I think it's not a bad aim to aim at something like that, even if you don't believe in all of it yeah. necessarily. It's good to keep them like yeah. underpinning Well, it's, it's, the, yeah, it's, it's the 12-step program with AA, right? First of all, you have to accept that you've got a problem. You know, you have to admit you have a problem. If you don't admit you've got a problem, you'll never get help. I witnessed this with my own brothers, two of which are still in prison today. The other one passed away from a heroin overdose. They, they just don't admit they've got a problem. They're like, no, I, I, I you know, I, I'm okay. Like, even though they're off their nut, you know, and doing what they're doing. And, you know, they've seen I've turned my life around and they're like, well, I want to do that. But they don't admit they've got a problem. You've got yeah. to admit you've got an issue. Then you've got to reach out to something, a power that's greater than you or somebody that can help you. And for me, it was, you know, God and all that in my personal journey. That's what helped me to turn my life around. I won't forget that, you know. Um, I, I, am I the same as I was when I first found God? No, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not the best Christian you'll find. I do still do a lot of things I shouldn't be doing yeah. as a Christian, as they say. But there's no such thing as a per- perfect person, simple no, as that. It. And I think that, that then led to me, you know, I went back to university. I studied uh, for a degree in theology of all things. Uh, which was unusual because, again, kicked out of school of 15 to take magic mushrooms. Then I find myself <laughs> in university. It was a bit nuts, really. I had to do a couple of exams to get in there. Met my wife, who's from Birmingham. as a strange accent. They got up there and they, oh, you're from Birmingham. How's she fitting in like that? Yeah. Right, I'm all right. I'm great. I'm great. So <laughs> I quickly moved my kids down here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they didn't get the accent. I got five kids, four boys and a girl. A cat, a dog, and a rabbit, and I love my rabbit. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so I've been married for 20-odd years. Marriage has been through all kinds of challenges because of my stupidity, obviously. Nobody else is not hers. My kids made loads of mistakes. And I think my life has been one of making lots of mistakes, but then getting over those mistakes and moving on. Learning from them. Yeah, and I think, but also in the process of using the pain you've been through then to help other people, because, you know, a lot of people out there will do things, make mistakes, and they feel judged rather than feel, you know, hang on a minute, I've made a mistake, but that's not the end of my life. Yeah. You know, one, one, one mistake doesn't define the rest of your future. Yeah, well, I think someone like yourself, and it seems to be uh, a pattern with the people that come in, they've done things they regret, but then when they can admit to that, and like you said, until you admit you've got a problem, you can't move forward, you're now in the position where you can come here or wherever you go on your talks, and you can open up and be honest and 
that's what truly gives the people hope that they can turn their lives around. Because yeah. if you went there and said, I was a good person and then I'm doing this, they're like, where's the contrast? Yeah. yeah. Where's the difference? Like, you don't relate to me. Whereas unless you've got the bollocks to open up yeah. about your own issues, no one's going to believe in what you're saying, are they? Yeah, there's, there's more authenticity in it. I mean, and then uh, even when you do that, I mean, I, I, I run rehabs for a few years, me and my wife. Uh, even recently, I was accused of running slave labour camps. These were rehabs. These were guys and girls that I helped to change their lives. And yet I had trolls on social media saying that I was using them as slaves. I, I had that, you know, allegedly. You know, it really, wasn't, yeah. not by mainstream media, because I would have sued them. Do you know what I mean? There's just, these are joking plastic journalists that are out there that want to make a name for themselves. They see someone like me and think, oh, he's got an interesting story, quite controversial. Let's pin this on him. And it don't stick, you know what I mean? But people do that to try and make a story for themselves. And working in that rehab, you know, when you consider the people we saw, these were people who were putting a needle in their arm every single day for a fix of heroin, otherwise they couldn't survive. We're taking them off the streets, transforming their lives, changing them, you know, through the programme what we had, and it was a rigid programme. Yes, it was strict, but it had to be because these people are indisciplined like myself. When I was younger, you need that around you. And then watching them grow, go back to college, university, to get jobs, to get married, some of them set up their own businesses. It was a success story. We had a 76% success rate in, in rehab. It's amazing, when, mate. When yeah. what my wife and I was running it. And, you know, I and obviously we left that then. That, that season had finished in our lives. And then I did a bit of TV as well. I had my own TV show on Channel 5. It takes a thief to catch a thief, which is the name of my book you, as well. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Yeah, yeah well, it's an old one now. I uh, met a uh, privilege of meeting David Hasselhoff on the one show. It's on YouTube if you want to catch it, by the way. Um, and it was great. So I've had a, I've had a very colourful experience, you know, and moving to the valleys as well was a big thing for me because I've grown to love the people in the valleys. You know, I just... The whole culture, the people, played rugby for Blindner for a couple of years, managed, uh, I was the first team coach for Abitur Excelsiors with the boys up there, being yeah. on tours with them, you know what happens on tours, boys, yeah. stays on tour. <laughs> you know, they're just great people, you know, and, and I think that was my road into politics because I saw what was happening in the valleys and I thought, you know, this is not right. Like, the, the politicians don't care about people. And I thought that's what they're there for and I suppose that's the next stage of my story, really. Yeah, definitely, mate. If you were my, we'll, we'll still... Because I think you, I want to talk about the rehab a little bit, yeah. if that's all right. Because I want to delve deeper into like your feelings on it. So obviously, you you took heroin when you were younger yourself, um, and you come clean off that. How was it like being around people who were at, still using then? Did when they first come to rehab, yeah. was it hard to be around that energy? Like, uh, not really. No, I think I think when you've seen the impact that it what it does to you. I mean. It's a physical addiction as well as a mental addiction. And some viewers, you know, hopefully if you're watching this and you are struggling with heroin, please get help, reach out. There are people out there that can help you. In fact, I sit on a, a board, I'm a chairman for an organisation called Livingston House that's based in Birmingham. Um, and we're, it's a clinical run detox, it's professionally run and all that kind of stuff. There, there, there are people out there, you know, contact the show, contact Joe, drop him a message privately, he'll send it to me and I'll try and set you up because I, I want to help people. I still, I still do that. Yeah, great. Mate. A lot of that stuff I do without people knowing. I don't broadcast it. I don't put it on my social media. I do a lot behind the scenes that people don't know about, you know, and I, I think that, that's just me. It's just who I am. But going back to that, yeah, it, it, you know, when you first come off stuff like that and you've been caught in it all your life, it's all you've ever known, it's very difficult for people to assimilate to normal living. When they're in a rehab program where everything is set for you, so you get up a certain time, you eat a certain time, you're on a works program, there's meditation, there's all the things that are put in place to keep your day full, because the worst thing for an addict is to be unoccupied in it. Let's be honest. If you're a smackhead and you know, you're on heroin and you've got nothing to do, that's the worst place to be. You need to be active and busy. Yeah. And I think putting that in place for people is important. Um, and, and then developing a program from there that when they release them, it's that ongoing support. So when they go back into the community, like a lot of the guys and girls we had in the program, some of them lapsed, which was quite sad. Some died. You know, went back out, relapsed, bang, gone, dead. It's, it's that serious. We're talking about life and death, you know. That's the kind of, the kind of drug that heroin is. But it's I think... Scary, man. Yeah, but I think if the support out there, there's not much of it from, from you know, the, the government. You know, obviously, they, they don't put money into it. A lot of the stuff out there is charitable works. Lots of charities do it because they, got, they just want to help people. Yeah. You know, a lot of churches out there and a lot of, um, you know, those kind of organisations of all faiths really help you know, reassimilate people into communities because they're keeping them, you know, in the safety of that faith community, if yeah. you like. And that helps a lot of people. What, what's your thoughts on, obviously, like, there's countries in the world now which are legalising all drugs, um, so they're able to tax them, they're able to, to make the supply of it cleaner. 
Um, they can help the people who actually need it more because there's less of a stigma around it. Yeah. I, I don't know, like, I'm obviously stating yeah. positives I mean, for this yeah, when I'm I mean, talking I, I've, about I've been it, asked but... this question quite a bit, Joe, and I, my, my opinion, I, I, I kind of go between the two. I, I see the positive, and then I see the negative. I see the negative as as, a, as an ex-kind of addict in that sense, and then I see the positive, you know, from the other side. I, I think, you know, the, the positive side to me, when you see, like, places in California, for example, where cannabis is legal in Amsterdam, and the drug trade, obviously, is... is it's, it's not as dark because it's legalized, so it can be controlled. If something's legalized, I know it's taxed, but it's controlled. Yeah. But when you're talking about stuff like the, the heroin and stuff like that, and then having safe rooms where they can inject. I mean, I go back to my days in Tlenetli. There was a drugs project in Tlenetli, and they used to give needles out to, to stop people sharing needles. Yeah. So, you know, that I'm going back 20-odd years ago. So that existed back then, but it wasn't a place where you could use the drugs, but they made sure you used drugs safely. So it's not an old thing. But I'm not too sure if it would work. It's, that's my honest opinion. I Sometimes I look, yeah, I think that'd be great. It'll help control it, you know, and stop some of the, the bad stuff that goes on around it because it's not yeah, just the, the crime drugs. It's the, it. it's the crime. It's the impact that it has on families and on crime as well. And I think, you know, it would reduce some of that. In my opinion, it would reduce it. But, you know, is it is it something the governments would do? Yeah. I don't think we would do it over you. I think there'd be an uproar if the government took that kind of stance. Yeah, even to propose it probably because we are quite set in our ways to a degree, aren't we? But, you know, they've done it with alcohol. I'm not saying maybe this is bad, but in some cases with some people, it's as bad as anything, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've seen people who are, who are drinking who, you know, probably worse than... I hope than you're not about me. I had a pint uh, before I'm I come here. I, yeah, I had a pint know. before I, I come here. I, I was thinking just before I said that, you just told me you had a pint before you come. I was thinking I'm going to say the wrong thing here, but I no. genuinely believe yeah. that. There's people, and just because it's socially acceptable, it's deemed acceptable, do you know what I mean? Because, yeah. you know, if... At two o'clock in the morning outside the Auberge and Abergavenny, there's twenty uh-huh. fights. Yeah, yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, what's worse? Yeah, like, yeah. It's a toss up, isn't it? It's just yeah, uh, it is. I mean, it's difficult isn't it? because the government obviously they, they they legislate to make something legal, they tax it, so there's always a money incentive. You have to realise with politicians, it's all about money and power. Yeah. Those two things. That's it. But uh, no matter who they are, even if they're nice politicians, money and power. They're the two things they look at. And, and it's the same with anything. And alcohol is one of those perfect examples. You know, you give the people the power to drink it, make it legal, you tax it, so you're making money off it. You know, it's as simple as that. And it's the same with everything else with yeah. politicians. And that's, that's probably why it's still so prevalent, I suppose, isn't it? and I, yeah. why they can't afford to put a ban on it, I'd imagine. Not, yeah. I, not that I'm saying I want that in any shape or form. No, no, don't say that. I'm goodness sake. I, I, I love that. the pub. I'm I like not a saying pint, that, man. But what I'm saying is, like, the, the difference between that and drugs. Yeah you know, maybe isn't that yeah. different. Well, it's not, is it? Let's be honest. I mean, everything's a drug. Coffee's a drug. Exactly. I mean, where, oh, far, where do you want to go? You know, every, everything, anything you can get addicted to is, is classed as a drug, I suppose. Yeah. You know, it's just classified by the government as different things. At the end of the day, recreational drugs, you know, we've all done it. I've done it. You know, you do stuff and you, do, but you're not addicted to it. Yeah. I think the, the problem you've got is, is when you have people whose lifestyle is built on that and nothing else. They don't have anything else. Some of the greatest sportsmen and women actually that have ever lived, if it hadn't been for the sport or discipline they were in, would ended would have ended up dead. They've admitted it, you know, whether it be drugs or alcohol, but it was boxing or, you know, uh, uh, athletics. So it was something that rescued them, yeah. you know, from what potentially could have destroyed them. And I, I, and I, I, I get that. I feel that because I've been there, you know. Do, do you think, as an, with an addictive personality, do you think that's such a thing? And also, do you think you, you go from one thing to another, whether that be from a bad thing to a good thing? Like, taking heroin to maybe yeah. being a boxer or yeah. however it works. Do you think it's yeah. a choice? Yeah. Not a choice. Yeah, but, but I, I do believe in addictive personalities. I, I mean, I've got addictive person. I know I have. I, you know, I, I admit it. I'm not going to, you know, I, I know I have. And you've got to make sure that that's why you've got to fill your day with productive things and otherwise you could end up doing wrong things, you know. Yeah. And I and I still do wrong things now. It's not as if I'm perfect, as I've already said to you. But it's that, you know, knowing where to draw the line to say, well, I'm going to make it, you know, that's enough, you know, that, just, just, just make sure I don't, I'm not addicted to this. You know, yeah. you have to have checks and balances. I mean, I remember a couple of weeks ago, I said my wife, we were drinking every single day of the lockdown and stuff. I said to her, I said, look, love, I said, let's just stop drinking for a couple of weeks just to make sure we're not addicted. You know, because I know what I'm like. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Lasted about three days. But anyway, no, the, <laughs> the, the, the point is, you know, there are, because I know, I know my, the thing is, if you've got an addictive personality, you know you have. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, I, and you know, that that's just how some people are built. That's probably in their DNA. I don't know what the science behind it is, but yeah. it is for me, you know? Because, yeah, like for me too, to a, to a minor degree, mostly I used to like smoke cigarettes and yeah. I'd either, when I was smoking cigarettes all the time, like 20 a day or whatever, I, I would be bang on on my diet. 
But when I'm not smoking and I'm eating like mad, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, like it's, it's always a trade off for something. Yeah. So like it's if I'm exercising like crazy, working, I mean, yeah. you know. And then I can. Well, you know, if I if I put as much energy into the gym as I did to the pub, I tell you what, I'd be fit, man. I seriously <laughs> would. Like, I, I would. I'd be super fit. I've been going to the gym. You'd be in a tank top, tank top over there, like. <laughs> yeah, not was, the yeah, yeah. I've been going. I've been going. I go to the physique gym in Amtelaire. You, Martin, and the guys. Up, I, I've been going there. I go every day in the morning. I drop the kids off at school first, do the school because I work from home, like you as well. I'm recording, you know, filming in my studio, like yourself. And so I, I actually drop the kids off, go there. I do forty minutes to an hour every single day, and you know, if nothing else. Even if I don't look ripped and I don't lose the weight, I feel better about oh, myself. Mate, sure. You know, it really makes me feel good. You know, I feel fresh as well. You know, normally think tired. I have one of these protein shakes and I'm not into the science. You know, everyone's all about, you know, do this, do that. I've had guys tell me, take these tablets, Rich, you get strong. I, feel, I don't want to know about that, boys. <laughs> I've tried it, been it, done it. You know, my good friend Mikey Arms, who's, uh, who loves training and all that. He, he nearly killed me in the gym, but he nearly killed me. He was like, good, oh, like, push it, push it. <laughs> but I was looking at it, I was like, ah, in the mirror going on. Yeah. And you do feel good, don't you? You do, mate. It, you cha- know, it changes your life. Factor, you know? It changes your life. For me, if I don't do something, if if I have two to three days off from doing anything, I start getting myself in this hole where I'm like, I can't see a way out. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and you think it's it's all these simple things that you know work for you, like training, eating yeah. right. But meditation is another thing yeah. which I find helps me quite a lot as well. Yeah. And well, you, that, you touched that, on that. Yeah, as meditation. Well. We're walk, going for walks. I mean, look, there's nothing better, right? Look at the beautiful places we live in the valleys here. Like you know, you you go to your front door, you're up on a mountain. Like I mean, it's stunning around you. Do you know what I mean? And it's free. It don't cost anything. Like it, you know, you you don't have to join a membership club. You just walk up the side of a mountain. You can find some beautiful spots overlooking the valleys, and you just just go for a walk, and yeah. it, it clears your mind so much. Like do you know what I mean? I I, enjoy, I I do. I know a lot of people do it as well. A lot of my friends do this as well. It really does help, doesn't it? The mental yeah. health and stuff. You know, a hundred percent, mate. And I, I've said it so many times. Like I remember years ago, I used to see someone out in the rain or walking up a mountain on a Sunday or. Run it like running in the rain or something. You drive past like you've just been at McDonald's or something after yeah. a hangover, and you're saying, "The fuck is that idiot doing?" <laughs> and now I'm that idiot. Do you know what I mean? Like my life's done a 360. You're not a rambler though. You're not going rambling with a stick and all that. Oh yeah, not one of them, it'll yeah. happen. <laughs> it'll happen. Like it's, it, it might be a few years off yeah, yet, but yeah. yeah no, I, if I walk Penavan, it's still in trainers and shorts. Like, <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah. No, mate. It's. Uh, Yes, well, it's nice. It's been great coming in. I, I really appreciate it, you know. And as I've said, you know, I mean, you know, I'm into other things now with politics and all that, which I'm not going to push on this show because it's not about politics. This show, I know that's about people's experiences. And I, I just want to say thank you for letting me come in and share my experience. And yeah, you mate, know, yeah, and, I appreciate you coming. I think it's good for people to see. Do you know what I mean? They can be in this place where yeah, people don't value them. People yeah. don't look at them like there's potential there. But then you come through the other side and look at you now. Do you know what I mean? You, yeah. You're, you're making waves. You're trying to do positive things. Well, and yeah, help yeah, people. yeah. When you look at it, like yes, you know, I I have to pinch myself. I, I'm not talking about politics. I know, but I stood in two elections. You know, I I was a smart kid on the streets of Lethley, and I stood in two elections. How does that work like? I mean, yeah. you know, there has to be something there in it for, for that to happen. Like, you know what I mean? Definitely, I just, man. And you know, and other people have got other stories as well where they were that way, but they turned to some kind of sport or some other kind of discipline. And I think, as I said earlier, I think this is the important point I want to try and finish on is. You know, one mistake or mistakes in your life don't define who you are. You're not a bad person because you do bad things. You know, it doesn't make make you a bad person or, a, or an evil person because you've made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. I don't care if there are people out there who pretend to be perfect and will tell you otherwise. They're lying to you. And they're even worse, actually, than the people that make the mistakes because they're hypocrites. The truth is we're all on a journey. We're all learning from each other's experiences. People, I always say, are like walk-in libraries. Whenever you speak to anybody, they're like an encyclopedia. Speak to an old person in their 80s. The stories that they tell you are phenomenal. You know, stuff you say, it's like, it's like sitting in a library. And so never treat someone with disrespect or put them down because you never know the demons that they're fighting. And until you've walked a mile in their shoes, don't judge them because you don't know what's going on behind closed doors or in their mind. And you might put them down one day and they might commit suicide the next day. And I would rather think that I'd rather, the only time I want to put my hand out is to pull someone up, not to put someone down. And I think if we all live by those basic principles of respect, even if I don't like you, I can respect you, you know. Um, but to judge people having not experienced what they've been through is one of the worst kinds of people, in my opinion, that you can be. We're all there. We've all messed up. We're all trying to make sense of it all. We're all trying to get through life and do what's right for our family, our children, our job. We're all trying to do what's right. So give us a bloody break and leave us get on with it and let's cheer each other on. How's that? 100%, mate. We, we are, that, that is an awesome place to end it, I think. 
I want to say I totally agree with you. We're too busy trying to put each other down, slag each other off. Let's help each other out. Even when it comes down to your close circle, your friends and all, we, we instantly get in this place where we just want to have a little moan about something they've done. Like you said, let's pull each other up. Let's just be more positive, help each other out, and uh, we'll all live better lives for and it. And on that note, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Experience Real, right? There it is. Make sure you subscribe to his channel because I tell you what, you've got some fantastic... I've, I've been watching you, mate. Fantastic Cheers, mate. guest. Love the show. Make sure you subscribe. Yeah. Check out Rich Politics as well <laughs> for some real politics, all right? Not this fake stuff. <laughs> Take it easy. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Experience Real.